completely different tastes. So each one of those personalities is actually a school of thought in their own right. They have their own taste. They give you a different feel. They give you a different perspective on how to live Islam. It's authentic. It's according to the Quran and the Sunnah. But still it's an individual. There's the individual taste and flavor to it. And you find there as well the responsiveness to the challenges and the demands of their time. And still you find the personal touch in that. So really it's a different journey. Every time I try to research the life of one of them, they take you on a different journey. And you appreciate the variety and the wealth that Islam actually offers. That Islam doesn't seek to cancel your individuality. As some people today who are practicing Islam, coming from with good intention, out of uh, goodwill, they think Islam is out there to cancel our differences and cancel our individuality. When in reality, Islam is not like this. Islam does call you back to your natural disposition, to your very human nature, it brings you back home. That's what Islam does. And then Islam also, once it, you know, blends or once, once it awakens this deepest part of who you are, and that's your fitrah, once it awakens it and it grows it, it also gives you a clear manifestation, practical lifestyle, where you can actually express this fitrah into worldly terms, into behavioral terms. So you can, you'll be acting, speaking and behaving what is in actually, actually inside you. You'd be giving it a, a clear voice or a clear shape, bringing it or translating it into a worldly reality. So that's a very profound aspect of Islam and you can find this in these scholars. So each one of them is different. So you can find that they were so much in touch with their time, they were responsive to the challenges of their time, yet they were profound and very well established in the book of Allah and the traditions or the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's a profound observation that I've been, to me it's a very enjoyable journey looking at these people and each one of them gives you a beautiful insight into how to relate to Islam and benefit from it and live it in our times. Uh, something else that, I, that is related to this, that I found very beneficial, is that there are people among the Muslim community and uh, in Muslim countries and different parts in the world who think that for you to be a Muslim, you have to be like their sheikh, like their teacher. For them, that's what Islam is. That's the only image of Islam. The further you are from that personal image, you know, the further you are from Islam, for them. And that's a very limited approach that is in defiance to the Quran and the Sunnah. I remember coming across one of the Tabi'een, and these are the generation that came after the companions of the Prophet. ﷺ. A profound statement where this Tabi'i said, He said, La tahmil sa'at al islami ala diqi sadrik. Do not take the vastness of Islam to the narrowness of your own personal approach. You're a human being. You have your limitations, you have your natural tendencies, you have your preferences, you have your passions, you have your own individuality. Do not impose this on Islam. Do not impose this on Islam because you are going to narrow down something that is vast and big. Yes, protecting the pristine message of Islam and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ from innovations, from newly introduced things, this is a very uh, lofty, honorable task to protect the pristine message of Islam, the purity of Islam, protect the Quran, the real meaning of the Quran, and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But going into extremes in that to cancel, to cancel people's individuality goes in defiance with everything we saw from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, from the Tabi'een, and from all of the generations that came throughout 14 centuries. So as we study these scholars, you're going to find each one of them takes you on a different journey. It's the same essence. It's the same essence, but the way they approach it, the way they manifest it, the way they express it, the way they bring it out into our physical reality is so profound. And as I said, it carries their own you know, trademark or their own fingerprints, their own individual approach. And that's what you're going to find. We spoke previously about uh, Amir al-Sha'bi. Amr bin Shurahil al-Sha'bi, who was in al-Kufa, Kufa which is to the south of Iraq today. 
Uh, Amr bin Shurahil al-Shabi said there was something that stands out about his character. Anyone remembers that? What was special about him? He didn't, yeah, he didn't like thick-blooded people. Like people who asked these dumb questions that really, the unwarranted questions. So, and he had what? How would he respond to these people? With jokes, with a sense of humor. Amr bin Shurahil al-Shabi had a sense of humor. So he used to make jokes, crack jokes, and you know, just turn into everything into some kind of humor. That was Amr bin Shurahil al-Shabi. His contemporary is the person we're going to talk about today. That's his contemporary, Al-Hasan al-Basri. We're going to talk about Al-Hasan al-Basri today, inshallah. Al-Hasan al-Basri was a contemporary. He and Amr al-Shabi lived almost this, at almost the same time. Almost the same time. Al-Hasan al-Basri is more of a sad person. Sad person. To the extent we're going to come across some statements from people who met him or dealt with him. They said, when you see Al-Hasan al-Basri, you think he lost a loved one just now. He looked sad all the time. He displayed a lot of sadness. Which is Islam? To have a sense of humor or to be sad? Which one is it? Amr al-Shabi or Al-Hasan al-Basri? Which one? Or did they come up with some innovation, some bid'ah? No, that's their personal demeanor. That's who they are. So Islam, Islam offers that individuality and it welcomes it and it just goes in line with it. It doesn't fight against it. It doesn't fight against human nature. So stripping people of their personal nature is not is alien to Islam. And this is the narrow-mindedness of certain individuals who did not really realize the, 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 uh, the vastness of Islam itself. And the vastness doesn't mean you water it down at all. It doesn't mean you water it down. But if someone senses out of themselves that they are narrow-minded somehow, their, their approach is quite rigid, and you know this could be at some stage in your life it could be especially when you start studying islam at the beginning you're going to be a little bit narrow-minded that's normal just like when you start studying any kind of field or any science or any discipline you're going to be narrow-minded because you are depending on assumptions you don't have a whole body of knowledge so you will have to substitute what you don't know with assumptions these assumptions could come from your upbringing from your past experiences from your culture from your own personal, you know, style, lifestyle. So if you recognize you're a bit narrow-minded, that's fine. You can live with it until, inshallah, you grow out of it with more studying, with more knowledge, and with more education. But do not start imposing this on everyone. That's the problem. Some people are too hasty. Yeah, so they see only one sheikh or two sheikhs or a group of sheikhs they have a, who have a, a similar style. And for them, that's what Islam is. Anything other than that is innovation. Anything other than that is not from Islam, it's alien, we have to fight it. They get engaged into a lot of politics. Wallahi, this is not Islam. And anyone, anyone who studied the lives of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, studied these early generations like a tabi'een, the great imams, he's going to see this clearly. There's a lot of var variety. There's a lot of space. There's a lot of accommodation for personal demeanor and personal individuality. So these are things we, we need to, I mean, they really become clear as you study these. Um, but there is something that stands out as well about Al-Hasan al-Basri and this is just profound and beautiful and before I get into his life I just want to share with you certain things about it Al-Hasan al-Basri like some of like the grandson of Al-Husayn radiyallahu anhu Al-Husayn ibn Ali the son of Ali Al-Husayn who have Al-Hasan and Al-Husayn right Al-Husayn uh, His son said about Al-Hasan al-Basri, Kalamuhu yushbihu kalam al-Anbiya. He said his statements, of al the statements of Al-Hasan al-Basri are similar to the statements, or they sound like the statements of the Prophets. Another person who met Al-Hasan al-Basri, he said, Wallahi inna kalamahu ashbahu bi kalam al-Sahaba. His words are similar, pretty much similar, to the words of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Another one said his words are similar to the words of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Abdullah bin Mas'ud anhu, is known for his profound statements. Short, but very rich statements. So Al-Hasan al-Basri was that kind of person. Allah gave him so much wisdom. And we know, like if you want to listen to a lot of what they call mawa'id, 
Mawa'id are soft speech that soften the heart. Things that awaken your iman, your faith. Usually you're gonna find something from Al-Hasan al-Basri. Statements of wisdom. You're gonna find a lot from Al-Hasan al-Basri. Why? This is something he stood out in. So he had this gift. He had this gift that was Al-Hasan al-Basri. So, sometimes when we try to study Islam, sometimes we get caught up in technicalities. It is important to study Aqeedah, to understand what you believe in, to get your mind right about what you are supposed to believe in. Okay, believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do you believe about Allah? Yes, it's fitrah, but you have to bring it to your mind and you might go wrong with that. But you, and you also might read some books or maybe you had some kind of influence from people who went wrong in studying belief, Aqeedah, the creed, or the tenets of Islam. So you need to consult the books of Aqeedah, the scholars of Aqeedah, to, un to make sure that what you understand about Allah, what you understand about the Day of Judgment, what you understand about the Quran, what you understand about the Prophet, about the angels, and about all of these articles of faith is actually correct. So your mind doesn't go astray when it comes to these things. It's also important to study fiqh. So you know how to worship Allah. You know how to get ready for salah, how to make wudu, how to perform your salah. How to, make your, uh, how to make fasting, how to fast. And make sure that you don't get your prayers invalid just because of one mistake. You do them as prescribed, the same with your salah, the same with your zakat, the way when you pay charity, the same when you do pilgrimage and hajj and so on and so forth. Everything, you need to learn fiqh. But these are technical knowledge. This is technical knowledge. It's about instructions. Do this, don't do that. If you do this, okay, this will be nullified. If you do this, then your prayer is valid and so on and so forth. These are technicalities. But these are not all what Islam is all about. So I came across something from a great scholar of the Muslims, Ibn al-Jawzi. Ibn al-Jawzi is known as well, this man, one day inshallah we're going to study his life. If Allah allows. Um, Ibn al-Jawzi wrote so many books and his statements are so profound as well. This man had so much wisdom. One of his most famous books is called Sayyid al-Khatir. Sayyid al-Khatir. Even the title of the book I find it difficult to translate into English, but it is so uh, it is so intelligent and sharp the way he came up with this title. Sayyid al Khatar is basically means hunting passing thoughts. That's what it means. So sometimes you have a flash in your head of a very profound realization idea. If you don't catch it, if you don't write it down and document it, Five minutes later, you'll forget about it completely and you try hard to come back to it, that's it, it's gone. It's just some kind of a flash, flashing. And it's very profound and beautiful and it has so much wisdom. So he says, Sayyid al Khatr, he says, these are my hunts of passing thoughts, flashing thoughts. I documented them for you. So they are very profound wisdom and they are like, I'm, I'm like they, they, they blow your mind when you read them because they are so profound. So in his book, he talks about uh, how, I mean, these things and the, the necessity for the students of knowledge to create a balance between technicality and the spiritual side of Islam. The spirit, so yes, you learn about Allah, what is correct about the names and attributes of Allah, so we don't go wrong, we learn the rules, but you also take the content, which is, okay, and now I, have the, I know the rules in order to understand the name of Allah, Al-Hakim or Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim and his attributes to understand them right. But I don't stop there. What is the impact of these names on me, on my life, on my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When I understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the creation, He's separate from His creation, He's above His throne. Most people, when they study these things, they say, that's it, that's the correct aqidah, and they close their minds. What is the impact on your heart of this? How does it impact your behavior? How does it impact your life? It's so profound and powerful. But most people who study these technicalities, they don't go there. So, uh, Ibn al-Jawzi said something very profound. He said, I'm going to read in Arabic and I will, then I will translate because his words are very profound and important for us today. This is something I personally st struggled with for years, studying technical knowledge, but not feeling any impact. And I remember watching an interview by one of the great scholars of our time, 
Dr. Sheikh Dr. Umar Al-Ashqar, the one who wrote the series, famous series on Iman, five or six books, Al-Imanu Billah, Al-Imanu Bil Yawm Al-Akhir, Al-Imanu Bil Malaika, and it's been translated into English, very popular in both Arabic and English, and translated into so many languages. Sheikh Umar Al-Ashqar, in, in an interview, TV interview, I remember, uh, he said something when he was young, in his, basically in his late 20s, early 30s, he said, I studied um, my bachelor's in Islamic sciences, then I studied my master's, then I studied my PhD. And he said, I go to my sheikh and I said, I've studied all of these, I've studied aqeed, I've studied fiqh, I've studied all the books, but I don't feel the level of my, my iman has gone really up. He mentioned this, there's so much technicalities, yes I understand, it's just about understanding about law, understanding about IT, how to do this, how to do that, fine, but what's the impact on me as a person? So, so, he's, so he says his sheikh did not provide him with a helpful answer, so he said I try, start, started trying to see my own approach to aqidah, how I can benefit from it, and this is why he wrote that series, six book series, Belief in Allah. Oh, uh, the Islamic creed, the Islamic creed. First one is belief in Allah, second one belief in the last day, belief in the messengers, belief in the angels, and so on and so on. And alam al-jinn wa shayateen, the world of unseen uh, jinn, and these spirits and the devils. So he wrote that, and he wrote it in a way that actually awakens your faith. And this is why subhanAllah Allah gave this book a lot of acceptance and popularity. So Ibn al-Jawzi says, رأيت الاشتغال بالفقه وسماع الحديث لا يكاد يكفي في صلاح القلب. I saw studying or being busy studying fiqh and Islamic jurisprudence and learning the hadith is not enough to correct the state of your heart. إلا أن يمزج بالرقائق والنظر في سير في سير السلف الصالحين. Unless you mix it. With al-raqaiq, heart-softening spiritual stuff from Islam. And looking into the life stories of the early generations, as salaf And he says, وَمَا أَخْبَرْتُكَ بِهَذَا إِلَّا بَعْدَ مُعَالَجَةٍ وَذَوْقٍ And I'm not saying this except after struggling with this and having a personal experience with it. لِأَنِّي وَجَدْتُ جُمْهُورَ الْمُحَدِّثِينَ وَطُلَّابَ الْحَدِيثِ because I found the students of hadith that their main concern is usually to get high quality hadith okay? and increasing the number of the hadith that they learn increasing okay, horizontally وجمهور الفقهاء في علوم الجدل وما يغلب به الخصم and I found the majority of the ones who study fiqh is that they worry a lot about debates and how to win a debate and find the correct answer. And he says, وَكَيْفَ يَرِقُّ الْقَلْبُ فِي هَذِهِ الْأَشْيَاءِ And how would the heart soften when you deal with these issues? How? So he's exclamating. Like the, the heart is not going to get soft with these. وَقَدْ كَانَ جَمَاعَةٌ مِّنَ السَّلَفِ يَقْصِدُونَ الْعَبْدَ الصَّالِحِ للنظر إلى سمته وهديه لا لاقتباس علمه وذلك أن ثمرة علمه هديه وسمته He says, and they used to be among the Salaf, among the early generations They used to be some, among them people who would approach or who would travel to someone like a scholar who would be teaching not to learn anything from him, any technical knowledge from him but just to observe him, how he behaves on a personal level. How he behaves on a personal level. That, that's, this is because the real fruit of learning and studying Islam is what shows in terms of mannerism, personal behavior, attitude and demeanor. That's the real fruit of knowledge. Then he says, after, uh, in the same context, about himself. So he says, then I gathered a lot of the stories of the early generations like Al-Hasan al-Basri, Sufyan al-Thawri, Ibrahim ibn Adham, Bishr al-Hafi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, uh, Ma'roof, and others in order to offer you, in order to offer you 
a taste of the beauty of their characters. So that's Ibn al-Jawzi speaking about 800 years ago. That's what he is saying. So inshallah, hopefully, as we are studying the lives of these people, we get to learn a lot from them. So let's get directly into the life of Al-Hasan al-Basri. Al-Hasan al-Basri, his name is Al-Hasan ibn Abi Al-Hasan al-Basri. Al-Hasan ibn Abi Al-Hasan al-Basri. So, his father, his father was a slave, was not a free man. At that time, we said there, were, there was slavery. So his father was a slave. His father comes originally from a town or a city in Persia called Maysan. Maysan. Jazakallah khair. Maysan. So his father is originally Persian and he was a slave. He was in Medina. His mother is, was also a slave. She wasn't a free woman. She wasn't a free woman. Later on, she was bought by Umm Salama. Umm Salama, radiyallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, she bought Khayra. Khayra is the name of the mother of Al-Hasan. She bought her when she was like a teenager. And then the father of Al-Hasan al-Basri, he liked this girl and he married her. And they were both still slaves, but later on they were freed. They were, so Al-Hasan al-Basri, when he was born, he was born to two slaves, people who did not own themselves. That's Al-Hasan al-Basri. Very simple kind of uh, origin or, or upbringing. The interesting thing was his mother, when he was young, his mother would get busy do things for Umm Salama. And this is something we need to understand about old times. You know, in, uh, in Islam, sometimes we have in fiqh, uh, you know, the issue of al-rada'. What is al-rada'? Breastfeeding. This was very common, by the way, and up until like 50 years ago. But now with modern life, this was sort of disappearing. Like when a woman had a child, almost every other woman in that neighborhood on the whole family would breastfeed that child as well. So a child in the first two years of his life or her life, they, they must have breast like uh, suckled from so many, so many, you know, women in that area. This is why in Islam it's a very important issue to check who is your mother, uh, suckler, su uh, suckling mother. Nursing, mother, nursing mother. It's very important to really know your nursing mother. It's very important. Why? Because it affects marriage, right? We said it affects marriage. It becomes like real motherhood. So. Al-Hasan al-Basri, when he was a child, he was nursed by Umm Salama radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet Obviously, the Prophet at the time had already died. Because Al-Hasan al-Basri was born around the year 21 after Hijrah. 21 after Hijrah. Who was the Khalifa at that time? Umar ibn al-Khattab. Yes, the Khalifa was Umar ibn al-Khattab. So, Al-Hasan al-Basri was born year 21 when was Umar ibn Khattab uh, martyred? When was he killed? Like 23. 23, yes. Umar ibn Khattab was martyred year 23. So Al-Hasan al-Basri was born two years before the death of Umar ibn Khattab. And it was reported that Al-Hasan al-Basri, when he was a little child, a toddler, he would come around the companions and Umar ibn Khattab. So Umar ibn Khattab saw him, he liked him. Umar al-Khattab saw him as a child, he liked him. And he made dua for him. He said, Allahumma faqihhu fi al-deen wa habibhu ila al-khalq. Oh Allah, give him knowledge of Islam, make him a person of knowledge, and put his love in the hearts of people. And that actually happened. That actually happened. So, that was the uh, upbringing or the beginning of uh, Al-Hasan al-Basri, so he was brought, he was born, brought up in Medina. So why is he called Al-Hasan al-Basri? Al-Basri means he's from Basra. Why is he called Al-Hasan al-Basri? Anyone can think about that? No, no none of his uh, forefathers were from Basra. He was from Persia. 
Because he later on moved and settled in Al-Basra. So people would be given the name either of the city of origin or city of birth or city of uh, residence. So they were given according to different, like, uh, different types. This is what they call in Arabic an nisbah People would be attributed as their last name to either a city or their family or their tribe or different things as well. Sometimes profession. So you have among the Arabs like family names like Al Khatib. Al Khatib. Who's Al Khatib? He's the teacher. Al Khatib, they used to give this name to a teacher, the one who used to teach children Quran. He was named Al Khatib. You have Al Najjar. What's Al Najjar? Carpenter. You have Al Haddad. These are last names. Blacksmith. Al Haddad. You have Al Halawani. People who make sweets. So you have Halawani as a last name. You have so many different names. And some names sometimes get really funny. <laughs> but you can offend some people if you get there. So let's move on. So Al Hassan al Basri was from a Tabi'een. Why? Because he witnessed the companions. So he met Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Umar. He met so many of the other companions. And he learned from many companions. Let's talk about his physical description. One of the first things that stand out about Al Hassan al Basri was his beauty. He was a handsome man. He was a handsome man. He was known for his handsomeness or his beauty as a man. To the extent that someone wanted to, uh, was traveling to learn from Al Hassan al Basri. So on the way to Al Basra, he passed by Al Kufa. And Al Kufa, he met Amir al Shabi that we talked about, Amir ibn Shurahil al Shabi. And remember, Amir ibn Shurahil al Shabi is a very sharp guy, has a sense of humor, and he gives sometimes sharp strange answers so the guy says to him uh, you know al hassan al basri so i'm i'm traveling to al basra so i want you to just tell me how can i find him give me a description he says listen it's easy you're going to find al hassan al basri easily the moment you get into al basra go to the main masjid al masjid al kabir go there and look in the faces of people once you find a person, you've never seen anyone like him, that's Al Hassan al Basri. Once you see someone, you haven't seen anyone like him, that's Al Hassan al Basri. So the guy actually travels to Al Kufa, he go, walks into the masjid, and he starts looking at people's faces. Only one person stood out as something, like a person who's never seen anyone like him. So he goes to him, he says, Al Hassan al Basri, he says, Yes, I am. <laughs> so he said, I had no difficulty finding him. So Al Hassan al Basri, was uh, known for his, okay, the beauty of his, of his uh, face. Uh, another person also pi, uh, pa, uh, was traveling to uh, Al-Basra, and his name is Asim, Asim Al-Ahwal. Now this is also uh, a nickname. Asim Al-Ahwal, he said, أَقُلْتُ لِلشَّعْبِ Okay, again, he asks a shabi, another person traveling. So he asked the shabi. Uh, I said to a shabi, I'm traveling to Basra, so is there anything I can get for you from there? He says, you know, you don't need to get anything from me, but once you go to Al-Basra, I want you to meet Al-Hassan Al-Basri and convey my salams to him, convey my greetings. But he says, I don't know him. Awesome. He said to a shabi, I don't know, I can't recognize him. He said, it's easy. Once you enter Basra, look in the faces of people. The most beautiful person you will find, and the person who really struck some kind of respect in your heart, that's going to be Al Hassan al Basri straight away. So the man says, As soon as I entered into Al Basra, I went to the masjid, and I saw a man where people were gathered around. I looked at his face, it was exactly the description. When I saw him, I had so much respect and admiration for him, and he was so handsome. So I knew it was Al Hassan al Basri. Uh, Ibn Hibban, the scholar of Hadith, he says, وَكَانَ الْحَسَنُ مِنْ أَفْصَحِ أَهْلِ الْبَصْرَةِ لِسَانًا وَأَجْمَلِهِمْ وَجْهًا وَأَعْبَدِهِمْ عِبَادَةً وَأَحْسَنِهِمْ عِشْرَةً وَأَنْقَاهُمْ بَدَنًا The so, scholar of Hadith, Ibn Hibban, he says, al Hassan, he was the most eloquent person in Al-Basra. Very good speech. The most beautiful, most handsome. The person, the best in terms of worship and righteousness. 
and the most or the nicest person that you would deal with and the most high hygienic in terms of how he dresses up and how he looks after his personal hygiene imagine these descriptions in one person yet al hasan al basri still was his body was strong so he was a masculine person he was and by the way there was there was no gyms at the time he didn't go to the gym he didn't have any kind of membership with <laughs> a good life here, LA fitness or no no the, their lifestyle was demanding physically demanding so these people were physically strong so listen to someone says Al Asma'i Al Asma'i the scholar of language he he narrates from his father from his dad he says his father said Ma ra'aytu a'rada zindan min al hasan kana arduhu shibra he, I've never seen a wrist as big as the wrist of Al Hassan Al Basri, the the width of his wrist was one hand span for me. You can imagine the wrist. I have a small wrist, but some people have very thick wrist. Yeah, Al Hassan Al Basri, his wrist was around one hand span. That shows you how much strong probably you know big size big size person as well. So that was Al Hassan al Basri. Al Dhahabi, the great scholar of hadith and the great scholar of Al Rijal, he knows about people a lot and he's written about Al Hassan al Basri. He says, Kana rajulan tam mashikli maliha surati bahiyya. He says, he was a, physically speaking, he was a complete human being. Physically speaking, he was a complete human being and he had a handsome face. Yunus ibn Ubaid, another person. Met al Hassan Basri, he says, Inna in kana rajul la yara al Hassan. I'm telling you about what now. Al Hassan al Basri is a scholar and he mastered a lot of sciences and he learned from the companions. Even during his lifetime, some of the companions said, You want to learn? Go to Al Hassan al Basri. Companions like Anas ibn Malik, the great companion, he said, Khudu an al Hassan al Basri, learn from al Hassan al Basri. Fa inna hu sami'a wa sami'na, because he learned and we learned. But he memorized and he kept it and we forgot. Why? Because Anas ibn Malik became very old. We said he lived more than a hundred years. So when you get too old, you get to forget. But Hassan al-Basri, okay, so he was like the companions of the Prophet testified that he's a man that you can learn from. But that's not on the only story. You learn from, once you see this person, you learn from them. Just by seeing them. Why? Because of their attitude. The beauty of their heart, the beauty of their character inspires you and teaches you a lot. That's the kind of learning. That's the kind of learning that we're missing out on today. We think it's all about information. No, learning is a human experience. You come in the presence of such a human being and they just, you learn a lot from them just by being in their presence. That's how, by the way, that's how the Prophet ﷺ was. This is why you find the statements of the Prophet ﷺ are small and short. They're not too many for uh, recording the, the life of one man who was teaching and who was educating for 23 years, such a rich, you know, this time in the life of the Prophet was extremely rich with events and things. Yet, look at the statements of the Prophet compared to this life and rich life, they seem to be little, but they were profound and beautiful. But his presence as well gave a lot of uh, knowledge and inspiration. So Yunus ibn Ubaid says, in kana rajulu, he says a person just sees Al Hassan al Basri. Upon seeing Al Hassan al Basri, he hasn't heard anything from him. He hasn't seen him doing anything, but he benefits from him. How does he benefit? He learns something. He gets inspired just by looking at that man. That's real knowledge. <coughs> He was a very brave man, so he took part in military expeditions as well. And uh, he was a very talented warrior, so he was good with the sword. He was very good with the sword at the time. And like he was known for, the, for bravery, he was known for bravery. Even Al-Muhallab ibn uh, Sufra, the Muslim leader who actually, who was leading the Muslim armies in 
Persia, in what's known today as Afghanistan, and in uh, India, and all these lands. Al-Muhallab ibn Abi Sufra. His main general, military commander was Al-Hasan al-Basri, one of his main ones. So he would always be in the front lines. And Hassan al-Basri as well, we said he was very well spoken, eloquent. So this is why his, uh, his words were profound and helpful. And we said, uh, some, like some of the tabi'een described him that his words are similar to the words of the prophets. So we're going to see some of his statements. Uh, Ayyub al-Sikhtiyani, the great Tabi'i, he said, Kana al-Hasan wa yatakallamu bi kalamin ka'annahu al-durr. Ayyub al-Sikhtiyani is very well known for his righteousness and worship. So he said, al-Hasan, when he speaks, he speaks only gems. You're going to get only gems from him. That's what he speaks. And we said, the grandson of al-Husayn, radiyallahu anhu, Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al-Husayn, said, ذاك الذي يشبه كلامه كلام الأنبياء. When he described the Hassan al-Basri, he said his words are similar to the words of the prophets. Uh, and a person called Umair, he said, ما رأيت أحدا أطول سكوتا من الحسن al-Basri. He said, I've never seen a man who's as quiet as al-Hassan al-Basri. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ أَحَدٌ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ إِذَا تَكَلَّمْ أَنْ لَا يَسْكُتَ مِنْهُ And he said, I've never loved, you know, when I heard a man speak, I never loved for someone to keep talking except for Al-Hasan al-Basri. When he talked, I didn't want him to stop. But he would rarely talk. He would be silent most of the time. And that's where actually sometimes wisdom comes from silence. Because silence means you're thinking, you're reflecting. And this is why sometimes they say, you know, Moments, you know, pausing moments between the speech give the speech its power and depth. And that's true. That's true. In terms of knowledge, Al-Hasan al-Basri, as we said, he reached the, 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 uh, the apex of knowledge of his time and he learned from, from all of the companions. So he was a scholar of hadith, a scholar of fiqh, and he was a scholar in zuhd, which is more of a spiritual approach. And Al-Hasan al-Basri, by the way, he had classes or halaqas in the masjid where he would teach fiqh and he would teach hadith and he was the master in all of these. And he, ha he had a special halaqa, private halaqa in his house. What is it? What was it about? He would not allow everyone, anyone into this. And it was about what they called a zuhd wal raqaiq and some of like al dhahabi called it ilm al batin knowing about the inner states of the heart inner states of the heart and by the way inshallah next weekend the series of talks that is meant to be here is actually is trying to probe that kind of knowledge that kind of science which is knowledge about the inner states of the heart intention love of allah a'malul qulub so he had a private kind of halaqa in his house and he would not allow anyone there why? Because some people are not ready to learn that. Some people are just not ready to learn that. And that's why, for example, you find Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, in his book, Madar al-Salikin, he talks about certain states, where the heart gets into certain states. And when the heart gets into some kind of understanding about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says many times throughout his book, he says, and not everyone is ready for that kind of knowledge. So if you, and this is what he says, so if you found your heart unable to grasp this, don't bother with it now. You're just not ready for it. And he says, don't criticize it because you can't understand it. Leave it and move on. Then he says a profound statement in Arabic. He says, فَإِنَّ لِهَذَا قُلُوبًا خُلِقَتْ لَهُ and He says, and for this kind of knowledge, sometimes there are hearts created for that type of knowledge, but not all hearts are created like that. So this is one of the Imams of Ahlul Sunnah saying something about this. So Al-Hasan al-Basri, this is why he had this private halaqa in his house, because not everyone is ready, not everyone is up to the level 
to understand these things about the soul, about the heart, about the fitrah, the states of the heart, diseases of the heart. Not everyone is ready for that. So you might be speaking to some people about this and they say, this is nonsense. This doesn't make any sense. I don't feel it. Now somebody, even sometimes today, you have some people saying, oh, what's the proof for that? There is a lot of proof. But the problem is, the problem is, a lot of people who ask specifically about these issues, what's the proof for that? And this is, a, by the way, this is a legitimate question. But sometimes people ask it too early. Why? Because there are things in Islam that you cannot take in a very simplistic manner from one evidence or from one verse or from one hadith. Sometimes it's an understanding that you take from a huge number of verses and a huge number of hadith, like the maqasid. Ilmul maqasid, the knowledge of the objectives behind legislation. The objectives behind legislation, okay, when Imam, the first person to write about it, uh, uh, to write specifically about it, Imam Shatabi, he says these are things you do not, you're not going to find a direct statement in the Quran or the hadith about this. You're not going to find it. But he says you can glean this from learning Islam and learning the Sharia and then you're going to develop this kind of understanding because you see it embedded in almost every verse and every hadith. And he says this kind of dalala, this kind of implication, okay, or this kind of meanings taken from the, from the, from the texts, okay, from the deeper meaning of the text, he says this is more profound than the immediate or direct indication of the text. This is at the beginning, at the muqaddimah, at the preface of his book, al muwafiqat So sometimes it's a legitimate question to ask, where is this? Where did you get, where's the proof for this? We have to, because you cannot take something in Islam without a proof. This is a, a legit question. But the manner of asking it, and the time of asking it, and your maturity in knowledge, in knowledge to ask about it, these are important factors to observe. So you might ask about something, where's the proof for this? I'm going to give you the proof, but you're not going to see the point. So you're going to say, oh, that's not a proof, I don't see it. You don't see it because you have not grown in knowledge. Up to that level where you can actually see the indication. Okay? So the indications in Islam, there is dalalat, there is mantuq, and there is mafhum. This is usul fiqh. Mantuq is a very immediate spoken indication. Wa'aqeemu salah. Allah says, well, establish the prayer. That's clear. <laughs> establish the prayer. Fine. But what do you find in Islam that a clear indication that preserving the mind is a priority over so many things? That Islam wants to preserve your mind. There is no verse, there is no hadith that says you have to preserve your mind. You're not going to find this. But when you study Islam, you're going to see Islam prohibits intoxicants. Alcohol, drug, anything that takes away your mind and your consciousness, or any kind of manipulation, even in Islam, any kind of mental game that you play on others is haram, by the way. Because it takes away the mind of that person, at least temporarily. It's haram. So you're going to find it all over the place in Islam that protecting the mind is a priority. But this takes a lot of studying, this takes a lot of maturity, and so on and so forth. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> Al Hassan al Basri was a person of knowledge. So he had knowledge of fiqh, he had knowledge of, of hadith, he had knowledge of, as we said, the spiritual side of Islam as well. So he was a master in all of these. Like uh, one of his students, Al Rabi ibn Anas al Bakri, he says, اختلفت إلى الحسن عشر سنين. I uh, spent ten years with Al Hassan al Basri, studying with him. And he says, فليس من يوم إلا وأنا أسمع منه شيئا لم أسمعه قبل ذلك. And he says, there is no day that I spent with him except that I learned from him something new I've never heard before from him. So that shows you the richness and variety uh, of his uh, his knowledge. So he personally met 120 from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he narrated so many hadith from uh, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
And in terms of worship, he was a worshipper. He was a worshipper. So Al Hassan al Basri would fast Al Ayyam al Bid, the three white days of every lunar month. Al Ayyam al Bid. And he would fast Mondays and Thursdays. Al Thnain wal Khamis. And he would fast most of Al Ashur al Hurum. Al Ashur al Hurum, the sacred four months. He would fast most of them. Okay? So that's Al Imam al Hassan. So he was known for his worship. So he'd pray so much at night. And we said Al-Hassan al-Basri was a person who was, whose demeanor was generally uh, flavored with sadness. With sadness. So he would often be sad and he would cry a lot. So oftentimes you'll find people describing him that I saw Al-Hassan al-Basri recite the Quran and he was tearing up most of the time. His beard was wet with his tears. So that's Al-Hassan al-Basri. At night he would stand up and pray at night. And he would always remind himself of, of the day of uh, judgment. And uh, so there are, there's a lot of descriptions, and I think we run out of time today. So it seems that Hassan al is going to take more time from us. So we might talk about him not next week, because next week we have the series of talks, maybe the week after, inshallah. We will talk about him. Uh, and what I will do, inshallah, that week is we'll also bring some of his profound statements and try to explain them. So we're going to go over his life again and some of the statements that were said about him and some incidents in his life. Inshallah, we'll move to talk about his wisdom and explore it, inshallah, more. So before we close, I'm going to take a couple of questions if we have. Any questions? Question? Yeah. What about who? Banu Najjar. Yes, uh, so people would basically uh, sometimes take their last name from profession of their grandfather. So Banu Najjar, who were in Medina, where the uh, mother of the Prophet ﷺ comes from there, uh, or her, sorry, her maternal uncles come from there. Her mother com comes from there. Yes, Banu Najjar, yes, obviously there was a carpenter in their ancestry. So they were named after that. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. So you'll find a lot of, like in the Arab world, and even not all, even in other cultures, I believe. Look at English as well. You have, you have Smith, right? You have other names that come from professions. Uh, Fisher. What? Fisher. Fisher as well, yes. Fisher. You'll find a lot of names that actually come from professions, or from a lifestyle, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's common. And I believe in other languages as well, right? other cultures. You must find something like this. Sheikh, you mentioned that it's, uh, like in Islam, it's, uh, it's vital to preserve your mind. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, like hypnosis, where they use it to cure or to, you know, to stop people from certain addictions, like drug addictions and stuff like that. Yeah. Where would that fall? Okay, that's a good question, hypnosis. So since Islam is about protecting the mind, preserving the mind, what about hypnosis? Because hypno hypnosis is more of an altered state of consciousness. So it sort of bypasses your immediate awareness, trying to, what they say, you know, feed into your subconscious mind directly. Um, there's something in Islam, they say, Al-Hukmu ala shay'i far'un an tasawwurihi. This is a qa'idah in fiqh. So it's a guiding principle. So it says, in order to make a judgment or an opinion about something, you need to understand it very well first. So what is hypnosis? I, at some stage I developed some interest there. I wanted to learn and understand what this process actually is, but I haven't really figured out. There's a lot of mystery about it, unless someone practices it. So I personally don't know exactly what hypnosis is, because hypnosis is not only one thing. Because they have what they call, for example, group hypnosis, where you sit and they get you to breathe, so you relax. So you're in a relaxed state of mind where they say, okay, your, your brain uh, is actually producing or functioning according to alpha waves now. Okay? So you're more relaxed, hypnosed. So you're willing to accept whatever you 
here. So they start giving you some kind of affirmation, some kind of mantra. Okay, they say, like they get people to breathe, breathe until they get into this kind of relaxed state and they start telling them, for example, if they have an issue, like with addiction, I'm free from addiction. I don't need to drink. I don't need to smoke. I'm free without it. I can relieve my mind and my soul without having to, you know, smoke that cigarette or before, before. so and so on and so forth. So they get people to visualize as well. So they, I'm not sure if this is exactly the hypnosis that sometimes people get. If you go on YouTube, you're going to find hypnosis. And that's basically, people are going to say, close your mind, start breathing, okay, in a certain way, a arithmetic way. And then they'll say, imagine yourself driving along the ocean. Then it's so peaceful. You get off your car, you walk on the beach, you can hear the waves, it's, you can hear the birds. It's beautiful, it's calm. Now all of you are getting hypnos <laughs> hypnotized now, okay? <laughs> some kind of hypnosis. So something similar like this, and they say, okay, you're free, you don't have any problems, you can, you're strong enough to face the situation. So that's, so I'm not sure if that's, because I've seen some other people practicing hypnosis where they actually do some trick, and they're, like, they, they really somehow, like, get you to, to lose touch with reality. So the, now the point is, what is hypnosis? Is it one thing or is it more than one? So we need to understand it before we can you know, pass a judgment on it. I personally don't really, I, I don't know what hypnosis is. I've never been hypnotized to my knowledge. And I haven't hypnotized any human being, so I don't know. I've seen some things on, online, on YouTube and things like that, but I don't know how genuine, how true these are. Because there are different claims about hypnosis sometimes you can get into a state where completely disconnected from reality. So I don't, really don't know. That's the answer. Uh, okay, I ha we don't have time, so... Inshallah, for the halaqa, we will meet not next week, but the week after. Uh, we'll carry on with the Hassan al-Basri. Uh, don't forget next week, inshallah, next weekend. We have to, because there's no, no time. But I can take your question later on, inshallah. Uh, next weekend, we have this long weekend. We're going to have a series of talks for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, inshallah, about treatment of the heart in Islam. How does Islam, you know, treat the heart, spiritual side of Islam, and what does Islam offer there, inshallah. So, jazakumullah khairan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.